स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया गुड मॉर्निंग सो वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट वॉट्स अ कैन सो सिटीजन केन एज अ कैन एज अ कैनोनिकल टेक्स्ट वी नो वेन अ वर्क ऑफ लिटरेचर वेन अ वर्क ऑफ आर्ट बिकम्स पार्ट ऑफ अ कैन एन इट मीन्स इट इट अडियर टू सर्टन प्रिंसिपल सर्टन स्टैंडर्ड्स एंड कैन कैन आर फॉर्म नॉट आर्बिट्ररली बट देर इज अ सिस्टम देर इज अ मैथड and yesterday we were looking at uh, a few books which are canonical anthologies which are anthologies about uh, canonical texts and what texts we are looking at films at, as texts so citizen kane as a canon as a canonical text now citizen kane which was made in 1941 produced by mercury uh, and rko mercury and rk ho and directed and starring of course the great orson welles 1915 to 1985 uh, popularly called the boy wonder of radio and stage he was a child prodigy he had uh, he started talking about films and making films and acting and uh, taking great interest very serious interest in theater but from a very young age and he shot into the limelight with the live radio broadcast of hg wells novel the war of the worlds and uh, this was also uh, the time of uh, the war and he did it so authentically that people started running out of fear they thought that uh, martians or some aliens have actually invaded the world so the pe uh, people ran about in terror and he was so authentic and it, his shows became so popular so uh, understandably many hollywood studios got interested in him and uh, started quoting him to make films for them rko studio was one studio i mean do you remember what, what were the other four big studios we are talking about the 40s studio system yes yes mgm Paramount, 20th Century Fox, Warner Brothers, yeah. So RKO uh, studio gave him complete freedom, and it was unheard of during that period. A 25-year-old person who has never had any uh, cinema experience behind him, any experience of making a movie, and he was given total control and total freedom to make the kind of film that he wanted to. he started he, uh, toying he was always extremely ambitious Let, uh, let's get one thing very clear about orson welles he he had a uh, very justifiably high opinion of himself and he was a prodigy he was a genius yes and he was very much aware of that okay so um, he uh, was asked uh, was typical of welles he started on a very ambitious project which got aborted because of various uh, uh, factors uh, joseph conrad's heart of darkness later on it was apocalypse now and we also know when we do capola we are going to discuss how many problems did capola face while making apocalypse now so heart of darkness is indeed heart of darkness and it was not an easy novel to translate to adapt Herman J Mankiewicz is another important name that you should know uh, the great screenwriter hmm? so one of the greatest screenwriters ever one herman mankiewicz that you must know about and other was of that period ben hest okay ben hest his works we will discuss when we dis, uh, when we talk about the studio years classic hollywood ben hest h e c -T. C H T. Okay, so in March 1940, Herman Mankiewicz produced a draft called American, 
depicting the rise and fall of a publishing tycoon, press tycoon Charles Foster Kane. And they revised and they did six versions of that draft and ultimately came up with the screenplay or a script of Citizen Kane. Wells and Mankiewicz collaborated on them, on the, on the draft. Now, this is how Citizen Kane was publicized. We are talking about how canons are formed. So, canons have to be in this day of media and publicity and press, canons have to, people have to be told that you are going to watch something that you have never watched before. And um, 365 days in the making and every minute of it an exciting new thrill for you. This is the way it was publicized. Radio's most dynamic artist, the man at whose voice a nation trembled, you know a direct reference to his rendition of War of the Worlds. Now, the screen's most exciting new star, Orson Welles in the picture Hollywood said he would never make, okay, and I'll finally, he is able to make the kind of picture. Uh, some other publicity lines, everybody is talking about it, okay. so very catchy, very short, you know, the classic story of power and the press. I hate him, I love him, he is a scoundrel, he is a saint, he is crazy, he is a genius, in short describing Orson Welles. Some called him a hero, others called him a, a heel. It could be Charles Foster Kane, it could also be <laughs> Orson Welles. So, this is the way, you know, so boy genius, boy wonder, yes, but also a person uh, people love to hate. See, when you achieve such kind of a, a success at such a young stage, young age, then automatically you generate lot of negativity, negativity as well. So, Citizen Kane everybody is talking about it. The fame factors, what the contributing factors into making it in uh, a canon. So, first was the controversy. So, this, this can give you a lot of food for thought. If filmmakers generate controversies and quote publicity or generate interest in their products. So, uh, it was apparently and now, it has been established that it was indeed based on the life of American newspaper Baron William Randolph Hearst. It was a very unflattering portrait of the, the man and as we were talking about it yesterday, Hearst did his best to suppress the film. He went as far as <coughs> stopping its exhibition in theatres uh, that he and his friends owned. Okay. Hearst, his life period 1863 to 1951. Hearst was um, inspired by the journalism of Joseph Pulitzer and he turned the newspaper into a combination of reformist investigative reporting and lurid sensationalism. So, that was Hearst and that is also Charles Foster Kane in Citizen Kane. Hearst also developed a reputation for employing the best journalists available, including Ambrose Bierce, Stephen Crane. Who was Stephen Crane? Who was Stephen Crane? Okay, that is your homework. Find out. I'll take down these names. Mark Twain, Richard Harding Crane. Davis and Jack London. You should know what these people are known for. And if they were all on the payroll, more or less, we cannot use a word like payroll for Mark Twain of course, but if these people were willingly contributing for Hearst papers, then it must mean that it must tell you how powerful he must have been. So, Hearst had studied at Harvard and then took over the San Francisco examiner from his father. He acquired the New York Morning Jour Journal, another paper, and launched the Evening Journal in 1896. So, some of his uh, contributions to journalism is that he sensationalized journalism, 
by the introduction of banner headlines and lavish illustrations. And you could look at his chain of newspapers that and mag periodicals and magazines, which included Chicago Examiner, Boston American, Cosmopolitan and Harper's Bazaar. So, a range of magazines and that is what we see uh, Kane doing as well in the movie. So, Hurst has actually built for himself a castle at Saint Simeon and this is paralleled in the film as Zanadu. Zanadu is a, of course, uh, a borrow, borrowed phrase a borrowed name from Kubla Khan, good. And he called, Hurst called his palace the ranch and in the, in the movie Citizen Kane, again there is a reference to the ranch. Do you remember? His second wife Susan, she lives in a place and that place has been gifted to her as an alimony by Cain and it is also called ranch, El Rancho. And one in interesting facet about his journalism was that he believed not just in investigating or reporting news, but in also in creating news. And this is something very interesting <laughs> that a magazine and a, a newspaper owners not just reporting, but also creating news. Okay. Of course, we know what it means and why, why it is done. So, um, such was the impact and influence of Hearst that at one stage movie industry got terrified by the negative publicity that Hearst was generating about the film. So, RKO was even offered money to burn the negatives of the film, do not release the picture at all. Cinema theatres as I was already telling you were asked not to exhibit the film and uh, after the release it achieved limited distribution because it was and this is important boycotted by territories owned by the big five studios. See studio control is extremely important and the biggest studio were big five studios were of course, MGM, Fox, Paramount and Warner Brothers. So, RKO was alienated in this battle because all the distributing territories were owned by studios and the big five, big other four studios decided to boycott the film. So, definitely it must have, we are talking about those days when television was not such a, such an important force. Okay, so, parallels between Hearst and Wells, both considered child geniuses. At the time of Citizen Kane, um, Hearst powers were already on the decline, he was 76, Cha Wells of course, was on the rise 25, both were obsessed with success in the profession of media. And uh, Wells of course, got very ambitious and felt that Hearst would not be able to do uh, much damage to him, but he was wrong to a large extent. See, remember a Citizen Kane as we were discussing yesterday, it often features in the uh, uh, best greatest, greatest films ever made list. Okay. It is a part of a canon, but that reputation came much later and we have been talking about that quite frequently. When did that reputation happen? Not when, not exactly when it was released, not immediately after it was released, because the campaign against it was so strong. Many people never bothered with the movie. It was it didn't even find a decent release. It didn't have a very good run at the box office. So we are not talking about a Shole here, okay? Which was an instant success. So when do we have been talking about it quite frequently in this class? Who are the people who established Wells? The French New Wave. So you see, when the authors and people like Andre Bazin and people like Godard and Truffaut and Rene and Chabrol, they started taking interest in Hollywood cinema after the war and after uh, a certain period when Hollywood cinema was uh, making its presence felt in France, in Europe. Okay, so, that was the time when Wells got noticed, not before that. 
otherwise every attempt was made to finish him off. So, another major reason for its fame and this is more abiding and it has got nothing to do with the controversy. So, the filmic qualities of the picture, it is indeed an excellently made film, even today if you watch it, there is never a dull moment there. Yeah, it is extremely fast paced, very well uh, directed and has some great performances. So, deeply innovative in several ways, for example, uh, the way uh, he uses perspectives, use of deep focus that is increasing the field of depth on screen, um, taking the perspective away from centrality of image. What do you understand by centrality of image or centrality of image? Focusing on a single entity. S exactly. Deep focus gave him the liberty to focus on other images as well. So, centrality is only on one object or one person was taken away. So, what he actually did was to break certain narrative traditions of Hollywood. Although, I am very sure he did not set out exactly to do that, but he was such a, an innovator that it all happened very naturally to him. So, uh, there is a story Although Hollywood always believed in when we do classic cinema, classic Hollywood, you have to understand something. Hollywood always believed in one credo and that was style should never outshine story, but Citizen Kane is one movie where style does outshine the story, okay, although there is a story. The movie opens and if you have watched the movie, you remember how it opens with um, a dying Charles Foster Kane in his Zanadu, in his estate castle uh, or castle and his last words are famous, last words rosebud. A journalist is assigned, you know the moment, it is a very unmelodramatic sequence, our hero dies, okay, he is in his mid 70s or late 70s and he just dies. So, a journalist is assigned to investigate the meaning of his dying word and who are the people who have heard the dying word? We are told that there is a nurse and there was a butler, we never get to see the butler there, but we are told that the butler knows that those were the dying words, Cain's Zanadu and this is the place where we are taken through very leisurely <coughs> camera movement, Cain, a dying Cain, while he utters his last words, he is holding a, a bowl, a glass bowl, which has an image, miniature cottage like thing, okay, covered in snow. And what does it mean? It is quite metaphorical, his childhood, harking back to his childhood, that is where he belonged. Okay, this is the place where he comes from, far, far away before. He, he, he was uh, given away by his parents to, uh, to be raised by, uh, he has this, uh, we are given a plot, there is a back story and uh, in short we are told that his parents are very poor, they run a very modest inn somewhere deep down in America, but he suddenly comes into huge inheritance and uh, one condition is that the boy should be taken away from his parents and he should be raised by a certain group of people and his guardians are um, a group of bankers okay, and they are the people who control his inheritance okay, and they are the people who have a complete authority or control over him uh, and they, they can raise him the way they want him, away from his parents. Okay. And his last words, Rosebud, they have a connection to his childhood. Okay. So, while he dies and the glass bowl falls into million of pieces and then we are the investi the journalist, we never see his face very clearly, this, this is very interesting. We never get to see the journalist who is investigating Rosebud very clearly, never see his face very clearly. Okay. 
So, uh, uh, if, uh, the first person he meets is his second wife, Cain's second wife, Susan. She is an alcoholic and she lives very lonely on a place called El Rancho, the ranch. During his investigation, the course of his investigation, he also meets Bernstein, Cain's collaborator in launching Cain's first newspaper, The Enquirer. He also meets Jedediah Leland, played by Joseph Cotton, Cain's best friend and also a theatre critic. The journalist also comes in contact with Cain's uh, butler, Raymond, who reveals details of Cain's life after Susan had left him. And now, uh, you must know that this uh, uh, device, this narrative device was followed in Velvet Gold Mine by Todd Haynes, where Christian Bale, a very young Christian Bale, investigates the death or suicide murder of a popular rock star of the British 60s cultural scenario. Evan McGregor and, and who else? Good. So, narrative structure is important. Journalistic, what we find on screen is a journalistic reconstruction of Cain's life. What we get are fragments from here and there about Cain. And then, how journalists read that this investigator, not just exactly investigator, but the journalist who is doing the case, who is doing the reporting, he reconstructs Cain's life. A series of witnesses with Cain's uh, associates give us multiple perspectives on Cain. So, you can also assume that this movie would, could have been an influence on Kurosawa's Rashomon, multiple perspectives. And this kind of device, you know, uh, that there is no fixed tr or um, stable truth, this was a device which went on to inform all works by Wells which is the illusionary nature of images and the difficulty of discovering the truth. And this is something that you find in most of his works, including his another popular film, The Magnificent Ambersons. So, we get to know about his childhood loss, the time when he was taken away from his mother and you can f uh, perhaps see a child playing in the background, very clearly depicted. Okay, so, he, he is an entity on which you are focused. So, taking the focus away from the centrality of image, that is what I was talking about. Using deep focus treatment, right. And you can also see the child through the window playing in the snow. So, the, those happy childhood days and that is what he remembers when he looks at that glass or crystal bowl at the end of his life. <coughs> he establishes the inquirer and look at the image of Orson Welles. What kind of an image is this? Ambition. ambition in what way? I mean, I am talking about the camera angle, the way he is projected. It is not very straightforward, right. There is an angle given to it. The entire world is looking at it. Perhaps, yeah, focus of attention, focus of attention surrounded by stacks, piles of his creation, something he is obsessed about. Uh, when we were doing montage, we watched this scene. He was first married to Miss Emily Norton president's niece and how as the distance between them grow, the distance between the dining table also increases. Remember that scene and how? So, that famous montage. So, they drift apart and this is very symbolically suggested through the scene at the dining table. He starts having an uh, extramarital affair with uh, 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 an actress, a stage actress. And uh, uh, once he is caught by his wife, he decides to divorce his wife 
and marry Susan, who is a struggling actress. And then what is the outcome of this marriage? Who remembers the movie? Well, you know, uh, he is an ambitious man. So, he does not like his wife to remain a nobody. He was once married to the niece of the president and he does not want his second wife to be a little miss nobody. So, he encourages her, his, her plans or her ambitions uh, of becoming a grand or great op opera singer and even builds an opera house for her. But the irony is, the tragedy is that she does not live up to the expectations, she just does not have it in her. Okay. The marriage crumbles because of his ambitions for her, she is not that ambitious, but she is forced to be ambitious and then his gradual, uh, but consistent disappointment in her and the marriage crumbles. She turns into an alcoholic and ends up lonely in the place called El Rancho. Uh, we are also told about Keynes political ambitions and political career and this image, a famous image from Citizen Kane, it tells you a lot about the man's megalomania, okay. his own image looming large in the background while he points towards it. Okay. So, larger than life persona and the entire world should revolve around his ambitions and his aspirations. When the end comes, he is left alone in his own palace and you see multiple images and another beautifully shot scene, okay, multiple images and this was another very uh, you know, personal favorite camera or cinematographic style of uh, Wells. He made another uh, popular movie called The Lady from Shanghai with Rita Hayworth in which he uses multiple images of Rita Hayworth in the film. So, very innovative movie, lots of images which are uh, or scenes which were quite experimental and innovative for those days and the mystery of Rosebud remains unsolved. What comes across is journalistic reconstruction of the man's image. He was like this, multiple perspectives on the man, but what was Rosebud? No one ever gets to know except the audience. And what do we see? The skating board or the sledge, yeah, the boy used to play with, when he was with his parents. And that is the, uh, and people say this is the, one of the worthless items, let us dispose of this. Okay. For him, that was his life. Although he has amassed so much of wealth and curios and priceless uh, pieces of art, works of art from all over the world. Okay. So, at, at the end when uh, uh, and, and the people take stock of his wealth, this is one thing that is considered useless and let us throw it away, very ironic. Other great works by Austin Wells. The Magnificent Ambersons, would you like to comment on the anything, any scene you remember from uh, Citizen Kane? Let us talk about it, I am just presuming that you are at least aware of the film, except the montage that we watched the other day. Are there any scenes from uh, Citizen Kane which spring to your mind. Paleri? Ranjit? Uh, in the beginning when they are uh, describing the splendors of Janadu, they show that it even has a mini zoo and all sorts of animals in it. A gondola, yeah. <laughs> golf course, all sorts of things are there. Yeah, so we are taken uh, you know very leisurely across the state, estate. Anything else you would like to remember or talk about? He buys all the papers and changes the reviews mm. about Susan's performance. Mm. That shows his power act. That was his? That shows his power. Like how he buys all the newspapers and uh, changes the reviews of Susan. Mm. 
so that's in a school. Yeah, yeah. So, rigging the reviews for Susan. Uh, Susan uh, at one point is given very negative reviews, and she is a very mediocre singer. But he buys the newspapers, and for I think that's the point of con dispute between Jedediah and him. Okay, because he forces Jedediah because his best friend, who has a certain credibility as a critic, and when he tries to buy uh, his friend over for his wife for his own personal ambitions, then there is a rift between the two. Good observation. A touch of evil, any comments on that? A lengthy shot. Like yeah, a long take. Exactly that five minutes for that the bomb to crash. Yes. Uh, Charleston Heston and Janet Leigh, where uh, Orson Welles himself plays a detective with ambiguous morals, walking with a walking stick. Okay, so, considered one of the best film noirs of all time, A Touch of Evil. How many of you have watched A Touch of Evil? Good. Okay, Chimes at Midnight is a reworking of Shakespeare's Macbeth. He also made Othello, The Lady from Shanghai. Mr. Akadin, that is one of his later films and uh, directed films, but if you go to the IMDB, you will find a whole list of films in which he acted. So, he was an actor, he remained an actor for a very long period of his life. So, Hollywood finished him off for a variety of reasons, a particular uh, the most important reason uh, was his own ambitions. He would not toe the line and you are as good as your last success in movie business especially where the stakes are so high and when your films do not bring the returns, but you still want to do things your own way, then it, it means trouble. So, that is what happened to Orson Welles. However, his reputation lives on base, basically based on Citizen Kane. Also, the Magnificent Ambersons is a very notab noted, notable, very worthy film, worthy successor to Citizen Kane, touch of evil too. And the lady from Shanghai, because of star presence of uh, Rita Hayworth, was a reasonable success as well. So, Wells left America in the 1950s, like Chaplin, he too was accused of being a communist and he was blacklisted during the McCarthy period. Do you remember any notable names from the McCarthy period who were also blacklisted? Elia Kazan, yes. Charlie Chaplin, the other day we were talking about Charlie Chaplin, right. So, Elia Kazan actually named names, but Charlie Chaplin was just blacklisted and he had to live in exile, Wells too. He returned once uh, that period subsided, but could never achieve the same heights, because the world had changed by that, the entire movie uh, universe had changed by the time he returned to Hollywood. So, he could never attain the same degree of freedom um, and success, and he just marched on uh, mainly as an actor. His legacy, what are the things we remember him for? So, these are his contributions. First, the use of deep focus and a very innovative use of montage. I may not be perhaps uh, be able to do Battleship Potemkin with you, but in Battleship Potemkin, we have one of the earliest examples of brilliantly done montage, which is that scene or does I step. How many of you do not know? I get lot of answers here. Are there people who do not know about, do not know? Okay, what happens is that, I, I think I referred to it once during one of the earlier classes, when there is a massacre um, uh, of innocent people by the Tsar's soldiers. Okay, and all the entire sequence takes place on you know, these great huge Odessa steps. 
and uh, we were also talking about intertextuality, inter intertextual reference. So, this scene was beautifully alluded in which great movie, not too old. I was watching that scene this morning on YouTube, it is very fresh in my mind. It is a homage to Einstein. Uh, Godfather, yes, but Godfather does not have any step sequence, yeah, that is a baptism massacre. Remember, while Sophie Coppola is getting baptized, <laughs> she, Sophie Coppola is actually the baby who gets baptized. Uh, so, uh, great montage, but not the one I am talking about, it is a direct reference massacre taking place on steps. Great movie, wonderful star cast. Brian De Palma, does it mean anything to you? Referencing the battleship Potemkin Odessa step scene. I am surprised, it is the untouchables, the untouchables, you must remember this. These things are a must for you to know. And the scene features Kevin Costner as a sergeant or detective Elliot Ness and a very young, very new Andy Garcia. It also had Sean Connery uh, in his only, one and only Oscar winning performance. Yeah, and Robert De Niro as Al Capone, <coughs> set in Chicago, Chicago during the prohibition period, 1930s. So, Robert De Niro playing Al Capone, one of his few negative roles, whereas Kevin Costner, Andy Garcia, Sean Connery, uh, Sean Connery are the heroes and they replicate the Odessa step scene. So, montage, okay, but there is no montage in uh, Coppola, uh, sorry Brian De Palma, sorry. Narrative structure, reconstructing a personality, reconstructing a series of events. So, that is one thing that, that is a legacy of uh, um, Orson Welles. He did not believe in linear, the idea of uh, the concept of linear storytelling. Nothing wrong with that, okay, but <laughs> yeah, linear storytelling is of course, uh, I mean look, uh, the godfather first part, okay, what kind of a storytelling is that? Very linear, very traditional, hmm? what happens to the second part? Yeah, he just plays around with the narrative jumps back in, you remember? Please, this is your homework for the long weekend, Thursday through Sunday, watch Godfather part 1 and part 2. Pallari, do not look at me with such disgust, <laughs> I am giving you something very nice to do for 4 days, Godfather part 1 and part 2, okay, that is your homework. Watch the movies, we are going to talk about, God, the, about uh, the Godfather trilogy as canonical text on Monday. Hmm? So, narrative structure, I am interested in narrative structure of uh, as introduced by Orson Welles and then how people followed him. So, that was his legacy. So, Coppola was uh, of course, he belonged to the school of Orson Welles. So, when he was for this is very interesting, all of you should know this, that when Coppola was first offered the Godfather, it was based on a novel by Mario Puzo, he did not like it, he was insulted, deeply offended, he said, what is this? Okay, I am after all, uh, uh, you know, I come from, uh, he came from uh, uh, a famous film school, not NYU, I think it was UCLA and uh, they were all trained in the art of cinema and uh, taking somebody else's material and then adapting it was definitely not his scene, he did not like it, he did not want to do it. So, it was turned down by many people and Coppola definitely did not want to do that. Why Paramount Pictures produced it, remember that, one big studio backing it. And he was told that if you make the movie, this is the kind of movie which will give you freedom to make any kind of movie later in your life. Therefore, because he could make Godfather, because he made Godfather the way the studio wanted him to do, uh, Godfather second was done his way. 
So, he played around with the narrative structure, he introduced a new character, Robert De Niro playing a young godfather and that was a bravura performance. I mean, it brought Robert De Niro from you know straight into the spotlight. What was, what were his earlier works? Only mean streets, not taxi driver, only he got taxi driver while he was still doing the godfather, because he, he had done mean streets with his courses and there was, this was a particular gang group of people, all new Hollywood filmmakers, his courses, Coppola, Brian De Palma, who else? Of course, Lucas Spielberg, but they are, they came slightly later. So, um, Scorsese and De Niro go back a long way and he had already worked in mean streets and we should be doing mean streets very soon in this class. So, uh, um, because of that on account of doing mean streets, uh, De Niro got his part in the Godfather and he did a part which is not in the novel. Okay and Coppola made it the way he wanted to do. So, again think of the, think of Orson Welles's influences on the way stories started being told. Or of course, changes would not happen all of a sudden, but he had a far reaching influence on a certain group of filmmakers, particularly the new Hollywood filmmakers. So, the second godfather is a tribute to that school of filmmaking. The first Godfather is a very traditional film, film. Therefore, when we talk about it as a canon, we will see how different it is from a movie like Citizen Kane. Godfather, the first Godfather follows all the rules, all the rules of the game. Okay, so, that is how you should think about films, you know, make connections, comparisons, influences, do not watch movies in a vacuum. So, the other day someone was talking about Mani Ratnam's, yes, I was discussing it with my family and they agree with you, all those people who have watched the movie. Uh, do you, can you compare it with Mani's other works? Is there any point, a thread that runs? You can't take like that. No? It, I don't. The good and bad are very well distinguished in his last two films, Ravan, Ravanan and do you agree? Shweta, you seem to be a fan. So. Um, I did not appreciate Ravana. Like Ravana was very, the camera work was spectacular, but the story was, it was too convoluted. It was too much complication. There were, there was, everyone was out to prove that there was more to them than that meets the eye. And what I hear about Kanan is that he has gone the other direction and everyone is either good or bad. Like, <laughs> okay, yeah, so uh, then it is more uh, in the Bombay tradition. In Bombay also there are good people and bad people, right, okay, but Bombay became a success because of, uh, you see there was a controversy, yes, a controversy does play an important role in making a movie notable or noticeable. Hmm. So, uh, some other movies which follow. Orson Welles school of filmmaking, uh, Apocalypse Now, The Second Godfather, Wall Street. Why do I mention Wall Street? Wall Street af after all has a very straightforward narrative. Greed is good, Gordon Gecko, one of the greatest characters ever. Have you watched Wall Street? Please do, please take it down, Wall Street. Who directed it? Oliver Stone. Charlie Sheen and Michael Martin Douglas, Martin of, Sheen uh, uh, yeah both actually Martin Charlie both are present in the as father and son. Martin is the good guy, Michael Douglas won his uh, Oscar for the movie, you must watch it and why, why do we mention Wall Street then? Greed is good, I just gave you the clue. That the credo, yes, ambition and the pitfalls of over ambition. Okay, and that is the credo Charles Foster Kane lives by too. Pulp fiction, obviously, because of the narrative, yeah. And that is what Godard remarks 
okay, everyone will always owe him everything. Okay, that's how influential he was considered. Uh, again, megalomania of the central character, who we, we see much later in the movie. Yeah, um, innovations, montage, use of sound. What what was so uh, smart about Citizen Kane's sound? There are lots of overlapping sounds. Okay, people talking over each other, things happening. You know, while someone is talking, you hear the uh, door shutting with a bang and an echo down the corridor. So, these things were never seen, I mean now we do not uh, even notice, but there was a time when it was quite very um, impressive, because of the times those were that was done. So, legacy, okay, any questions, any comments on citizen Kane? mentioning the overlapping songs. Exactly. It is a common feature in Iranian cinema. And when did Iranian cinema happen? Yeah, it is quite, I mean, recently. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, we all owe everything to Orson Welles, if you go by what Godad had to believe, yeah, Godad had to tell us. So, everyone owes him everything. Okay. So, thank you very much. We meet on Monday now.